Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for introducing yourselves in the chat and filling out the poll questions. I'll share the results of those soon, so feel free to continue to look through them and submit your responses. In the meantime, I'll introduce myself. My name is Brennison Wheeler. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the education, the community education and outreach manager at Women's Advocates, which is a nonprofit organization in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we offer a continuum of, of safety through our prevention programming, emergency shelter, and aftercare housing support services for victim survivors of domestic violence. A few quick announcements and reminders. We will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recording of the webinar, a PDF of the PowerPoint slides, and information on how to receive a certificate of attendance. This is a webinar, which means that attendees' videos and microphones are automatically turned off, so no one can hear you um, or see you. Uh, before we officially dive into tonight's webinar, I want to acknowledge and um, just extend gratitude for our ASL interpreters and for all of you for joining today. And then just a reminder, if you do send messages in the chat that you'd like everyone to see, just double checking your settings to make sure that it is being sent to everyone, to all panelists and all attendees, so we can all benefit from your message. So today's webinar is about how we can think about talking about our past experiences of abuse with other people. And so before we officially dive in, I'll end the poll and share the results. So it looks like 41% of us are feeling a little cloudy, which is completely valid and understandable. Another 38% are sunshine. Um, we have some other responses to that as well. I think I identify with sunshine today. And then for the question about which of the following is your preferred method of communicating sensitive or vulnerable information, 59% of us said in person, face to face. And then 15% said via text, email, social media. And then another 15% said with a handwritten or typed letter or message. I think for me, sometimes I've had a lot of success with writing a letter and then talking about it with them afterward, because that way I can get all of my thoughts out. Sometimes I get a little flustered or forget what I wanted to say when it's in the moment. And so I think being able to pair those two together is something that has worked for me personally. And then one way that you'd like to take care of yourself after this webinar. So 54% said walk around, go outside. If you're in Minnesota, it does seem like it's a beautiful day out. So that sounds like a really great idea. A lot of others are saying that they want to clean up their space, talk to someone, listen to music or a podcast, maybe stretch. So thank you for sharing that. So when you registered for this webinar, you would have seen three learning objectives that are very similar to these. And so our intention is to provide a space for exploring our intuition, our experiences, and our relationships with our own stories, as well as evaluating strategies and methods and ways of thinking about how we can share our stories with care and discuss what support looks like, what it might feel like, what it sounds like, when sharing about our experiences. So with that, I would like to provide again, a few reminders. We do have some more people that have joined us from the beginning and we often get a lot of questions about this, um, but just a reminder that it is what, this is a webinar. So only the presenter is visible as well as the interpreters, all the attendees, cameras and microphones are automatically turned off. And a follow-up email will be sent after the event that includes the link to the recording of the webinar, PowerPoint slides, resources, a survey, and how to request a certificate of attendance that can be used as CEUs. So this webinar is also, again, intended to serve as a starting point for anyone who is looking for a space to think more about their past experiences and how they might wanna talk about them with other people. So this conversation is definitely ongoing. 
And I also wanted to provide a disclaimer that everyone is different. And with that, everything in this webinar is definitely an offering and it is not the only way to think about things or to approach things. So certain information may not apply to you or your situation. So you're encouraged to take what is helpful and to leave what might not be as helpful. And feel free to engage throughout the chat, send your thoughts, your responses, your reactions, maybe any suggestions that you have, or if you do have any specific questions that you'd like for you know, the attendees to talk about or for me to respond to, you can send those in the Q&A as well. So I would like to invite everyone to take a moment to connect to your breath and to be in your body if it feels safe for you to do so today. So some of the content in this webinar, it may bring up some discomfort, anxiety, or troubling emotions or memories. So we encourage you to take care of yourself, to honor your needs, and know that you can always step away or watch the webinar recording at another time. It is completely optional, but <clears throat> if you would like to take a collective breath and join me in that, I invite you to first Feel your feet on the ground. I'm going to clear my throat really quickly. <clears throat> Feel your feet on the ground or the places where your legs or other parts of your body might touch your chair or wherever you are sitting or standing. You're welcome to breathe in through your nose for four, three, two, and hold for four, three, two, and breathe out of your mouth for four, three, two, and then hold here for four, three, two, and then allow your natural breath to ease back in. Maybe you're continuing to focus your attention on the qualities of your breath, but not trying to control it in any way, just bringing awareness. So thank you if you chose to participate in that, if you chose to do something else with that time, that is completely okay too. So just to start, I'd like to read this quote because I believe it to be very relevant to today's topic. It's by Rebecca Solnit. She says, stories save your life and stories are your life. We are our stories. Stories that can be both prison and the crowbar to break open the door of that prison. We make stories to save ourselves or to chop ourselves or others. Stories that lift us up or smash us against the stone wall of our own limits and fears. Liberation is always in part a storytelling process. Breaking stories, breaking silences, making new stories. A free person tells her own story. A valued person lives in a society in which her story has a place. So I don't know if people have heard of that quote before, but it definitely really resonated with me and seemed very applicable to today's topic. So I hope you benefited from hearing it. So for some of us, abuse may be a part of our story. Uh, you do not have to identify your experience as abuse to benefit from this webinar. But in this context, abuse can include, but is not limited, to childhood abuse, neglect, endangerment, adult intimate partner violence, sexual violence, assault, and rape. So this particular webinar might have some examples that focus on sharing past experiences of sexual and or intimate partner violence, specifically with maybe a new partner. But most of the content in general is, or most of the content is general enough to apply to sharing information with other people in our lives as well. So while we're talking about our stories, I also wanted to extend the notion that you are the author, the owner, the holder of your story. So you get to decide what feels right to claim. So the way you talk about your experiences and the words you identify with, all of that can evolve as you grow and change. So some examples of the way you can take ownership of your story is deciding what words and terms you identify with, the ones that feel right to you. So. Some people really 
um, think about their own identity of, of what it means to have these experiences. They might say, I'm a survivor, or I'm a victim, I'm a thriver, I've heard Sir Thriver, or survivor or victim survivor um, hyphenated. So there's a lot of different ways to think about that. You can also not have a certain label to it and focus on the experience and say, I'm someone who has experienced abuse or has experienced X, Y, and Z. So again, whatever feels right for you, people have different opinions and ways that they feel empowered. So you can decide. And that again, is always subject to change as you grow. And maybe for the details that you might share in the way you describe your experiences, maybe you say, I was raped. Maybe that's really hard to say. Maybe you feel more comfortable saying someone took advantage of you or something scary happened to you. So there's a lot of different ways to describe that as well, which is totally up to you. And then in terms of kind of choosing what feels like honoring you and your experiences. So maybe you say, my ex abused me or my past relationship was toxic or I did not feel safe in my, in my previous relationship. So again, lots of different ways <clears throat> to think about this. Yeah, I'm seeing some, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on, sorry. <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot in the chat about different ways that people identify. So some people are sharing that they identify as a thriver. Some say that they're a victim, survivor, and thriver, or a survivor of childhood sexual assault. They are a warrior. So there's a lot of different ways to think of it too. So thank you for sharing that. And while this webinar is about thinking about the choice of sharing, please know that you're allowed to choose that you don't want to talk about your past experiences. If you choose not to share, it does not make your experiences less valid, less real, or less legitimate. And also just because you're in a relationship with someone, that does not mean that you're obligated to share everything with them. Again, that can apply to other people in your life too, if it's a family member or a therapist or anyone you don't have to, you're not obligated to share, right? So there's a lot of different reasons why someone would choose not to share their experiences. And for people who might have suspicions or other things, it's important for us to be able to respect and honor that choice of choosing not to share if that's what they think is best for them. However, if you do choose to share, I just want to remind you and let you know that you definitely deserve to be, uh, <clears throat> to feel safe, to be believed, to feel empowered, to feel supported, validated, held, loved, respected, anything that might be missing on this list too. And you deserve to feel that way, whether it's right before, while you're having a conversation, or anytime after braving that vulnerable space. <clears throat> I'm so sorry about my throat, everyone. Okay, so if you're feeling hesitant, if you fear being judged, being blamed or misunderstood, or feeling uncomfortable, even thinking about telling someone you care about, about your experiences with abuse, please know that you're not alone. I think it's really important to normalize that these feelings are a part of the process. They can be an indicator to us that something very significant has happened. And an offering that I have for you is to think about how you feel about your own experiences. Sometimes we invalidate, minimize, or deny our own experiences, often in an effort to protect ourselves. This can show up in how we interact with others, how, <clears throat> how so the question that I have is how can we first honor our own experiences and the impact that they had on us and meet ourselves with gentle, um, empathy, non-judgment, and compassion. So that can be a loaded question as well to, to confront. Um, but similarly, feeling discomfort about sharing something that had a significant impact on various aspects of your life and maybe even your sense of self, that makes sense. It's valid, it's understandable, and it can also be a catalyst for deeper connections. 
So you may have heard of the saying, there's no comfort in the growth zone and no growth in the comfort zone. And I bring this up not to shame anyone who finds new solace in what's comfortable, but to acknowledge that there can be value with this discomfort and that it might be a part of the process. And then another emotion that may arise when we're thinking about talking to someone about our past experiences, particularly maybe a new romantic partner, um, might be fear. Fear of judgment, again, fear of rejection, fear of not being believed. Um, a section from the article that I linked at the bottom of this slide says, sex for many people, even without sexual trauma, is often inherently an act of vulnerability, where we are naked physically and emotionally. Having to discuss sexual trauma adds an additional layer of vulnerability and can be traumatizing in itself. It's just a really heavy thing to tell someone and it can change how they think about you. Letting go of that control, how someone thinks of you and letting them have their own reaction and understanding of that part of you is really hard. It's hard to revisit an experience which was incredibly traumatic and is perhaps linked to feelings of shame or blame. We often go into these conversations with a lot of fear around how that person will react, how they make sense of it, what will they ask, what will they think. We worry about what stereotypes or assumptions they might bring into it. When people have disclosed this to their partners, they feel safer during sex to share boundaries, what they enjoy and what they don't, often leading to more sexual enjoyment and relaxation. <clears throat> and so that excerpt made me think of Brené Brown's definition of vulnerability which is the definition of vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. But vulnerability is not weakness. It's our most accurate measure of courage. When the barrier is our belief about vulnerability, the question becomes, are we willing to show up and be seen when we can't control the outcome? When the barrier to vulnerability is about safety, the question becomes, are we willing to create courageous space spaces so we can be fully seen? And honestly, sometimes the answer to those questions is no, and that's okay too. So practicing self-compassion and patience with our healing journeys is certainly paramount. So speaking of vulnerability, one of the most courageous things we can do for ourselves is to create a space for self-compassion and for self-love. So experiencing any form of trauma, including abuse from someone who says that they love you can change our relationships with ourselves and the patience and understanding that we extend to ourselves, maybe even impacting our ability to tune in and to be in touch with ourselves, with our intuition, with our inner sense of knowing. And sometimes it can be tough for people who have experienced abuse to trust themselves, to trust others, to even assess what is the right decision, what is the right time and the right thing to say before we dive too deep into sharing our stories with others. I would like to offer us just a few minutes here to set the tone of connecting to ourselves and leaning into our internal world. So I'll only play a few minutes of this meditation, meditation from Sarah Bull, um, Blondin, Blondin, and you can listen to the rest at another time if you'd like to. So I'll make sure I include that in the email. Today on Live Awake, loving and listening to yourself. Notice who came forward within you when you said these words to yourself. The self that arrived when you touched your heart and spoke lovingly to it. This, my dear one, is your unstoried self. You have just summoned your highest self forward. The gentle love that lives inside of you. The gentle light. the self free from limits and heavy identities. How beautiful you are there behind your image. Realize your power in this moment. How you can reach out from your busy life and connect here. I hope you can feel the tenderness in meeting this self now, in the quiet of this moment. 
speaking these words to your heart acts as a reconnection with the self we often ignore and sever ourselves from. Saying these words to yourself realigns you with the part of you that gets left out in the dark most days and is often neglected and forgotten as we follow our pursuits. I love you and I am listening reconnects us with the other half. And that half is our true nature, the self we forget to nurture and love. So that's just a few minutes from that meditation. And I encourage you to listen to the rest of it if you would like to on your own. Uh, Yes, the link will be included when I send out the PowerPoint. So thank you for... Thank you for joining me in that if you did. The next thing that I would like to introduce us to do as we start talking more about our shared experiences is one important consideration about having an awareness of what a supportive response might sound like. So maybe you've shared your experience before and you wish you would have had a different response or maybe the response you received was really supportive. Or maybe these are phrases you say to yourself about your own experiences. So this is completely anonymous. So feel free to submit what you would like. I'm gonna send the link in the chat here. You can also scan the QR code with your phone or any device with that camera and pull up the link that way as well. So you can start to think of some things that you wish someone would say or that they did say that felt really supportive. And we can start to look at that together. So I'm going to share the screen. So I'm just gonna read some of them as they come up. You are so strong, you are so thoughtful, you are valuable, you didn't know better, you are not alone, you are so brave to share your story, I'm sorry. You deserved a safe person to talk to. I'm so sorry that happened. You didn't deserve it and I'm honored you felt you could share that with me. You are brave in ways that you should never have had to be. That was really powerful. Um, Maybe nothing is being said and someone's just giving a hug. You are worthy and loved. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry that happened. Your feelings are valid. You deserve so much more. I'm sorry you went through that. You're doing the best you could with the skills and resources that you had at that time. I love you. It only makes me love you more. I'm sorry that happened to you. This shouldn't have happened to you. Thank you for telling me. Yeah. I don't know about you all, but I do even feel like some sense of healing of even hearing these or seeing these. Um these responses. So feel free to continue to send them in if you would like. For the sake of time, I think we will continue, but thank you so much for sharing. This is um, something we might revisit at the end too when we're talking more about um, our experiences and what we would like to hear from others. So thank you. And feel free to send any in the chat too if you'd like, but I'll keep that um, kind of word cloud thing up so people can continue to contribute. 
So a very common response to experiencing trauma is dissociation or suppressing what has happened to us because it's too painful to think about. So if you are someone who hasn't thought about your experiences, it could be difficult for you to share them with other people. And you might benefit from a dedicated time and space to sit with yourself and learn more <clears throat> about how your past experiences may <clears throat> be impacting you in the present moment. And here are some journaling prompts to explore some of these topics. And I think the first two bullet points might provide more clarity about whether or not you wanna talk about your past experiences related to abuse. So just thinking about where you are today, what areas of your life might be causing you the most concern and emotional pain. And part of that might be because you feel <clears throat> that you're misunderstood or you know, there's a lot of different things that could be related to that. Um, but maybe your emotional needs are being met Maybe there's different feelings that you're experiencing as a result of those unmet needs. So these are just some things to just dive into that space and learn more about what you might need at this time and what you're experiencing, what healing means to you and all of those things. So journaling can be a very powerful outlet and a tool for rediscovering the self. And so here are three different resources um, including a guide to thinking about your own trauma narrative, which could be an entire webinar in itself, but that's a really helpful starting point. So again, all of those links you can click on in the slides when I send them out. <clears throat> so here are some potential motivations for talking about past experiences of abuse. So maybe for some people, they really want to feel closer to someone and they feel like it's an important part of progressing and deepening the relationship. That might not be the case for everyone, but that might be one potential motivation. Another might be this desire to explain a tendency, a behavior, a mindset, um, something about you to someone else where, oh, maybe that's why this one thing really bothers me because of past experiences that I've had. Maybe it just provides more context for that. So similarly, it might contextualize certain boundaries that you have where it doesn't seem as arbitrary. It's more stemmed in your past experiences. Um, maybe that your past experiences are having a, a negative impact on your relationship. It might be limiting intimacy or causing avoidance or holding you back from fully being able to embrace and experience the love that they might be extending to you. And so that might be a reason for why you'd want to share some of your past experiences. And another is just because you want to. So you, that just might be, um, it might not fall into any of those specific categories on the screen, but you might say, this is important for this other person to know. And then another thing to consider too, is if there's other motivations and just kind of being honest with yourself of, am I looking for sympathy? Am I looking for, um, like, what is the reason for this? Am I only sharing because they've shared so much about their life and I haven't shared this certain aspect of mine, um, but you truly don't want to, you know, so just being able to be honest about your authentic motivations is important as well, too. And again, there's no right or wrong motivation, but um, just thinking of who you would be sharing that information for and what the result of that might be. Another thing to consider if you do choose to share is that so the person receiving that, you know, hearing your story might respond and ask, oh, how, what do you want me to say? What do you need from me? How can I support you? I don't know what to say. <clears throat> and so these are some things that could be answers to that of, I just wanted you to know uh, I want to know that you care for me unconditionally, you don't view me in a negative light, and that you're here to support me. And I think some of the fear of, oh, I don't want them to view me differently. Sometimes it's not always negative, right? Sometimes they might view you as some of the responses that people sent in that word cloud of, you are so strong, or you we're so resilient when you shouldn't have been in that situation in the first place, you know? So it's not, some people really fear pity and sometimes it's not, they see strength, they see courage. 
they see, you know, gentleness, all of these things. Another might be, you say, I don't exactly know how you can support me right now. Maybe like someone said in the word cloud, you just need a hug. You just want that physical comfort. Um, but you might say, just by listening and honoring my story, I feel heard and seen, thank you. Or another response might be sharing something specific of, you know, here's a specific boundary based on this experience. I can't deal with swearing during sex at all. That's very triggering for me. So that's always something I explain to people. So kind of phrasing it that way might provide a, oh, it's not you. It's it's something that is just something that is uncomfortable for me and because of my past experiences. So here's a boundary. It might also be something of, I want you to know that I really care about you and our relationship. And I've had some experiences that make it difficult for me to trust fully and have resulted in some trauma responses even when I am safe. So maybe there's certain things um, that you want them to know this isn't something they're causing. It's just because of past things that have happened. So in the chat, some people are sharing a quote that they love is, I pray you heal from things no one ever apologized for. Um, another person in the chat said, I use my own experience so they know that I understand what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different levels to empathy too and ways of approaching that. So in terms of assessing if you want to or even feel ready to share information about your experiences, I think one important thing to kind of cherish and hold on to is that you are more than what has happened to you. And so being able to connect with someone who also believes that could be really important for you. So asking yourself, does this person know you well enough to see this information as important, but not defining all of who you are? And again, it can be hard to assess. Um, I think sometimes ways of thinking of that is, how does this person see me? What are the ways that they talk about me to other people or the ways that they indicate how they view me to myself of if I make a mistake are they you know saying oh that's you know you're more than that one mistake you know there's other ways of kind of looking for observations that they might um you know not say oh because you shared this I'm only going to view you as someone who has experienced you know, sexual violence or whatever the case is. Um, it's that you're still that whole person with all of these other experiences. And I think that might be something that's important to assess. And even assessing if you feel like you resonate with that. And then the displays of empathy. So maybe do you, you have enough information to gauge whether you can trust them to have a sincere and thoughtful response. And so there's, oh, I have another slide about other indicators that it might be safe to, to share with someone. So we'll talk about that more later, but just having that question answered could be helpful and give you more clarity. And then another about trust, whether it's trusting yourself or trusting others. Do you feel that that person can respect and honor your story? Have they respected and honored the stories of others? Maybe how do they respond to things in the media or in the news or um, shows that you might watch? Are they, you know, displaying anything about victim blaming or are they supportive? Um, those are ways to assess that. And then do you trust yourself to be able to show up in that vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable space? And do you trust that you're able to tap into what your needs are and be able to support yourself? Because sometimes um, it can be really scary to go into that space not knowing um, what you might need or ways to feel supported. And so being able to trust yourself to honor your story, honor how you're feeling in that moment can be an important part of the process too. So maybe through that or through the journaling practices or other things too, you've determined that you want to share what's happened to you. And you're thinking, okay, now what do I do? And so there's this quote from an article that I also linked to the slide about what matters most is that the decision to disclose is one that makes you feel empowered and safe. And so being able to connect again, those words that we talked about earlier to your experiences. So being able to dedicate this time to think about how you describe your experiences and words. 
So a lot of people have different memories in different ways. Maybe it's just very visual. You can remember exactly what happened. Maybe it's certain ways that you've described it to yourself. These are things that have happened to me. You can decide how much detail or how little detail you want to share. You can decide which of those details are important, which you prefer to keep to yourself. You can set those boundaries and expectations in advance too of, oh, if this person asks, you know, specific details of what happened in, in certain ways, you can say, I don't feel comfortable sharing that, but I'll share maybe focus more on the impact or how I felt during that time or other things too that might feel more accessible to you. And then another part is maybe leaning on your support network. So maybe if this isn't your first time sharing your experience with another person and you have others, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a family member or friend, you can lean on them and maybe tell them, um, tell someone that already knows part of your story that you're planning on telling your new partner or whoever it is, new friend, a new coworker about this information so you can kind of have them check in and see how it went after. And then maybe even lean on them for support for brainstorming how you could bring, bring it up in conversation. So related to signs that it might be safe to share your story, maybe you have seen times when that person has shown empathy towards other people's experiences, as I mentioned before. Maybe if there have been conversations related to trauma, they didn't demonstrate victim blaming thoughts and attitudes and that may have been affirming for you. They respect other boundaries that you've set before too, that could be a good indicator. Maybe that they have shown you listening skills, empathetic and compassionate listening. Maybe they've also been vulnerable about their own experiences that sometimes makes people more comfortable and open to being able to share about themselves. So those can be indicators as well. And if you think of others that have really stood out to you that you'd like to share, feel free to send those in the chat. I know that I'm a big like energy person too. So if I can feel their energy and feel kind of their spirit in a way, that can be really helpful too of um, maybe some of these signs aren't as apparent, but I just really can trust my intuition that this person will be supportive or will at least listen to what I have to say, meet it with kindness and not with judgment. So if you're trying to think of ways to maybe practice conceptualizing your experience, especially if you haven't really thought about it too much before, it might be helpful to write your story down. So again, it doesn't have to be um, like a clear narrative with the beginning and an end. It can be um, bullets, it can be circles, it can be you know just different things that you are writing down. It can be fragmented, it can be more of this happened, it can be more chronological, it can be more focused on your emotions, or you can, you know, just write down different details that stand out to you. And then you can kind of weave them together and think about the words you'll use to describe those things as well. Maybe you practice saying things out loud in front of a mirror and seeing what you look like when you say those words out loud. And that can be kind of a little bit of desensitization too, where you're not, it's not as a scary thing. If you, your, your body kind of remembers, oh, okay, I've said this before. Um, it's not completely new. Of course, it might be, it's the first time you're telling that person. So that might contribute to feeling less familiar um, and uncertain of how they're going to respond, but that can be supportive. Maybe even role-playing with a trusted person. So saying, oh, can I just practice what I might say? And you can respond in a way that you think that they might respond just so I can prepare myself for those potential things and how I can practice maybe asserting a boundary or saying, um, I'm not comfortable sharing more details right now. That's, that's the extent to which I would like you to know. Um, there's a lot of different ways for that too. <clears throat> Someone's sharing in the chat that they're willing to share because they've learned that their truth is what sets them free, whether others agree or not. They feel that they need to be honest to deal with all the trauma, not run away from experiences, but accept 
that they occurred and to be honest about their, their responsibility, if any. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think being able to come to terms with that of, of why you might want to share, what the motivations for that are, um, and being clear about that can be really supportive. So for you, maybe you just feel a deep sense of authenticity and being able to be honest about those things with certain people. I think that that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for sharing that. So in terms of ways of sharing, there's other ways that you can approach it too. So this other quote from the same article is, remember, even if you start to disclose, you can stop at any time if you feel unsafe. And again, you don't even have to feel unsafe. It can be just because you don't want to continue. Maybe you started and you realize that you don't want to continue and it doesn't feel comfortable. And you can say, you know, maybe we'll talk about it at another time, or I'll let you know if I want to resume talking about this. But if you do start to share, again, as we mentioned earlier, you can write a letter. I know some people said that they enjoy writing a letter or sending a text or crafting an email or maybe even writing a poem. So that written word, I know sometimes people have a hard time, you know, speaking, communicating, um, like with that other person at the same time where maybe they fear interruption or being misunderstood or not being able to have all of their thoughts fully collected. So writing things down can help kind of get the whole comprehensive story and be able to share that. But maybe you prefer to speak from the heart. Uh, maybe you create this comfortable and inviting space to maybe start this conversation. You might read something that you wrote aloud or you know, share what you've practiced with other people um, or ask them you know, for the next 10 minutes, is it okay if I just share some things without interruption and then I check in with you and see how you're doing after that just because it helps me, you know, keep my train of thought and everything too. Those are definitely things that you can request. And then for visual, maybe you even use a movie or video or show or something that you really resonated with that might depict a related experience that you can use just to um, start the conversation. So maybe you're creative, maybe you make a collage or some piece of art or something else to talk about your experiences or the impact that it's had on you. So there's a lot of different options that you can explore for that too. So some specific examples of these words. So maybe you say something like, I have something important to tell you and I feel nervous. I was sexually assaulted and it feels important that you know. Or maybe you say, I wanna tell you about past relationships I've had where I didn't feel safe. I value, you can name certain aspects of our relationship and I'm excited to continue to grow with you. But some parts of what I've experienced in the past are also a part of who I am today. So maybe that's all that you say, or maybe you expand. Again, if it ever feels like you're having to justify or validate or prove things, that might be an indicator to you where you can ask them, you know, hey, it kind of sounds like you're asking me to prove these things. And I'd appreciate if you could just kind of take my word as I'm telling you or however you'd like to express that. There's also a lot of different levels of sharing too of the amount of details of as we've talked already. So maybe you say, I'm not ready to talk about it in too much detail, but I want to let you know that I don't like to do X and I prefer instead X because of something really difficult that happened to me in the past. So that's a little more vague, but again, if it feels empowering to you to let them know more of the specifics, uh, maybe some people will view it more as like chronological and they'll go through a chronological series of events and they don't attach emotions or impact to it or maybe they do um and so you can kind of again it's up to you to decide the different level and the different level of detail that you share and then maybe even before you start sharing you can set boundaries or expectations and say I want to discuss something really hard for me I would like you to just listen as I tell you and then we can talk about it together I wanted to tell you that this happened to me, but I don't feel comfortable sharing any more details about it right now. I know for me, sometimes I've tried to 
speak from the heart and share things out loud. And then it made it really difficult where maybe I was crying too much or I just had a very strong emotional response. So I started typing on my phone in my notes and kind of showed them um, what I was trying to communicate. And then they, so that can kind of be a way to, um, so there's a lot of different approaches to specific ways you can share. <clears throat> and then another reminder that you choose to share um, what you choose is up to you. And just because they ask a question, maybe requesting more details, that doesn't mean you have to tell them or answer. You can always say again, I don't feel comfortable sharing any more details right now. You can say, I'll share it another time when I feel ready. Um, or maybe that's, that's the amount that I feel comfortable now. So maybe <clears throat> my apologies, I do not know why I'm losing my voice, but I'm navigating responses and reactions to sharing. So maybe you're at the point where someone you're, you've shared and now maybe um, you're waiting, you're that kind of silence before of, okay, what are they gonna say? How are they gonna feel? Maybe they pull you in for a hug, you know, other things, or maybe they don't know what to say. They're very surprised. Um, but one thing is definitely to be mindful of your own emotional capacity. So being able to honor yourself first and foremost and thinking, okay, what do I need? And prioritizing that because sometimes people share that they do a lot of emotional labor, um, unfortunately, for that other person where you just kind of shared something very vulnerable and then you're having to support them in, in holding your story. Um, maybe you express curiosity and say, how do you feel after hearing this? Um, and maybe if you have certain curiosities in your head, you verbalize them and just ask instead of, you know, making assumptions of, oh, they probably view me in this way, or they probably think of me in this way, or whatever the case is, you can ask them like, oh, I'm curious, do you think this or that? Um, and they can clarify for you. Maybe space is needed. Maybe saying, would you like some space and time to process? When can I check in with you? Um, maybe time might be needed. So maybe you still want to spend time with that person, but you're not sure what to say or or you don't want to continue talking about it in that moment. So maybe you say, can we watch a movie or a show? And then we can check in um, with each other after. And that question mark is supposed to be after the word after. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways to kind of navigate those responses. And um, Again, not focusing too much on that, but still, you know, being receptive and seeing what they have to say is definitely important. <laughs> and so thinking of that in advance might be helpful. And then this article also shared a lot of different potential emotions that the person you shared with my experience. So I thought it was helpful. Um, there's one of anger. So the article talks about how many people might say that they feel really angry toward the person that caused the harm to, toward the perpetrator, the ex or whoever it was. So they might express that they wanna seek revenge on your behalf or all these other things. I think um, they talk about it being a natural way to feel, but it, again, it's not always helpful um, to turn to that. Sometimes that person might feel um, confusion um, they might be so scared of saying the wrong thing that they'll stall um, for time by asking a lot of questions about the assault or what led up to it. So maybe it just is confusing to them or other things. So those questions um, might make it sound like they're blaming you for what happened or suggesting that you could have avoided the attack by doing something different. Um, and so if that's how you're experiencing it, it's important to be able to let them know and remind them that the best thing they can do is to just support you and to not be an investigator, to not be an interrogator, just to be someone um, who's there to support. And maybe a, a better alternative question is, how can I be there for you? How can I support you? Um, instead of what were you doing? Why were you there? Or why didn't you stop it? Or whatever the case is. Maybe they also feel fear. So loved ones might fear for your safety or feel really protective. Um, and again, while it might be 
helpful and okay to want to help being overly protective of someone who's experienced um, trauma can take away from their feelings of control over their own decisions too. So making sure that you are not taking power and control and autonomy away from them. Another emotion that they talk about is frustration. So someone who cares about you may feel powerless um, to help. Maybe they feel really frustrated. Um, again, reminding them that healing is different for everyone and it may take a longer time. And it's important that those supporting you are patient. Um, and then guilt is another one too. Some people might feel guilty or responsible for what happened, um, even if they're not. They may be thinking of how they could have prevented it from happening. Um, again, the fact is that the only person responsible for that is the person who caused that harm. Um, and so being able to remind them of that too, of it was their decision to do that. And um, that's where the responsibility lies. Um, and so that can sometimes become a response of, oh, I wish I would have spoke up or, oh, it was my responsibility to stop that person from hurting you, whatever the case is. Um, and then shock. Sometimes people will feel shock or shocked or maybe disturbed that someone that they cared about has had these traumatic experiences. But sometimes it can come across as like not believing it, right? And so we want to make sure that we're valuing um, believing the victim survivor or the person who has had that experience and honoring that even it might even though it might be surprising to that person. Um, being able to say, I believe you. And, and I, I and, you know, sometimes of saying, oh, I can't believe that, like that can be, feel very invalidating, but might be just again, representative of that shock. So again, related to what we did with the word cloud earlier um, is what supportive responses could sound like. So saying things like, I believe you, thank you for telling me. Will you let me know if and when you wanna talk about um, certain things? So that could be how I can support you, how that may inform our relationship, what potential triggers might be, how that person could know if they do wanna talk about it more. Um, maybe saying, again, it's not your fault. You didn't deserve to be treated that way. You are special to me and it's important that you feel safe, respected and cared for when you're around me. Um, maybe saying it's not easy to share information like that. I'm sorry this happened. You are more than these experiences. I love you. Um, I think sometimes people think, oh, that's inherent. Like, oh, they automatically will know that, you know, all of these things. But actually hearing them can be very, very important. Saying I admire your ability to share this with me. You're not alone and I'm here to support you however you want me to. I care about you and I'm here to listen or help in any way. So those are some examples in addition to all the other things that people um, talked about. And then navigating unsupportive reactions. So some of those unsupportive reactions could be doubting or questioning, again, not believing, asking what you were wearing or doing when this all occurred, asking what you did to provoke it, saying you should have gotten over it by now, reactions that feel invalidating, shaming, blaming, all of those things are unsupportive. And so an important reminder might be to remember that their reaction is a reflection of them and not you, right? And then being able to prioritize your emotional safety needs and then reflect on why they may have reacted that way when you feel ready to do so. Um, and then being able to, you know, maybe reach out to someone to maybe professional support or someone you trust to unpack what happened um, and be able to take care of yourself. But maybe you ask yourself, is it because it triggered their own trauma? Is it because they're scared or angry or feeling a certain way? Um, are they reacting like this due to not understanding trauma, sexual assault and, and the impact that it can have? And then again, considering if that's someone that you feel safe, comfortable, and happy to um, kind of be in a relationship with, and if you want to continue, um, if they have that unsupportive reaction. And it looks like we'll wrap up early. Um, so, to, so this was supposed to be fully 90 minutes, but I think we'll wrap up in 60, if that's okay with everyone. But the last kind of bit that I have for you is this idea of self-care. Um, so 
after kind of sharing your experiences, you may feel a lot of different things. You may feel drained, you may feel depleted, you may feel relieved. Um, whatever the feeling is, you might want to think about ways that you can support yourself. Um, so there's a lot of different things on the screen on the screen about things that you can do in terms of um, connecting with something healing. Maybe you rewrite your story. Maybe you nourish your body. Um, get yourself a gift or create art, meditate, nurture, all these other suggestions um, or things that you identified at the beginning of the webinar and the poll. So just other ways to support yourself after that too can be a really important aspect of this. And then I'll leave you all with this quote about, um, it's from Lisa Oliveira, and I think it is really, um, has a lot of different things in it for us to think about. So it says, pain is not meant to be ran from, nor is joy meant to be clung to. All of it is meant to be allowed as it arises and equally allowed to pass as it is meant to. Your uncertainty is a sign of presence. There is no one way to feel in any given situation or experience. We are in control of so little and being in control is never the point. Beautiful things can be painful. Painful things can also be beautiful. What does it look like to soften, to allow yourself to thaw in places that were once hardened? to let yourself release in spaces that were held, once held too tightly. Your tenderness is necessary. This to me is what living is for, learning to be with all of it as gently and tenderly as we can. And then these are some more resources to explore these different components further. Um, and so if you're looking for even more to to think about how to talk about past experiences. There's a lot of different resources on this slide that you can click through. And other than that, we'd love for you to connect with us online, like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, Twitter. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where we post the recordings for all of our webinars. And you can also reach out to us via email. And when you close out of the webinar, you will get, um, it will automatically pop up a survey where you can share your thoughts and your experiences with us. We're always looking for ways to improve. Um, and so if there's specific topics or specific organizations that you would like for us to collaborate with, feel free to recommend those in the survey and we will try to do our best to meet that need and that request. And then if you're looking for a certificate of attendance, um, feel free to email us at outreach at wadvocates.org um, and send, you know, with the subject line certificate, and then we'll send it to you in the next few days. Make sure that your first and last name is somewhere in your email um, so we can know what name to display on the certificate. So hopefully you enjoy having 30 minutes of um, time for yourself or other things that you would like <laughs> to do. And so I really appreciate you, everyone's, um, everyone's attention and time and contributions. And maybe I'll just pull up the um, other things that we all contributed to to look at as we head out. Um, Cause I think there's been some additions. So. Thank you so much. I hope you benefited from this webinar and got what you were looking for. And thank you again to our lovely interpreters. I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording.